Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, Calgary, Alberta, Monday, uh, June 28th. And I'm happy to be here. This is a 30-minute live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And we'll be on talking today about um, emotional abuse. I want to continue with that. That's what we were talking about all last week. And, um, yeah, so it's so good to be here. I'm just drinking coffee and waking up. And I just want to let everybody know I'm not a professional counselor or therapist. I don't have any certificates in those areas, you know. I'm just a person who does my own blog talk shows, a private citizen, really, um, because I just wanted to be one more voice. And um, I just wanted to um, share information that I find as I am a child rights advocate and also uh, a part-time student at MRU here in Calgary studying child rights and uh, international community development. And um, so I just, I'm just i still studying. I'm in between courses. And as I find the information, I, I just wanted to, to be able to share it with people and you know to let them know that you know they're not alone, especially survivors of child abuse, right? And... Um, so all of my shows, you know, are, are uh, centered around abuse, child abuse, domestic violence, adult survivor issues and whatnot. And, um, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion because uh, the topics of abuse are very sensitive. And, you know, people can be triggered by certain things uh, and certain, uh, you know, topics and whatnot will trigger people, especially survivors of uh, of child abuse, right? So it's so important that you know, you know, what you should be listening to. And if you find the topic uncomfortable, just turn the show off because that will you won't be hurting my feelings at all. And uh, children under the age of 18, especially young children, I just ask that you have someone listen to the show with you and have permission to listen to my shows because, you know, it's so important, right? You have to keep yourself safe online and you really should let an adult know what you're listening to at all times and especially uh, in chat rooms and whatnot because... You know, there's people out there, the FBI and different uh, different groups out there who are trying to stop child sexual predators, but there's so many out there, you know, that, that they can't stop them all right now. So you need to keep yourself safe, and uh, there's ways to do that. Just uh, search in, you know, on your browser, child uh, internet safety, internet safety for children, how to stay safe online, these types of things, and it will bring up websites for you where that will show you how to stay safe online. It's so important. You could save your life. You could save your, your friends' lives by telling them. And you do want to keep yourself safe online. So that's why I ask everyone who's under the age of 18, especially really young children, to have permission to listen to my shows. You would be doing yourself a favor and myself a favor because ultimately it's about stopping child abuse. And um, But the thing is, is, there's a lot of adult material on my shows. And so and abuse is not talked about very often, right? That's the whole issue. And that's why I wanted to be... One more voice out there just to say that we need to stop child abuse uh, along with all the other people out there who are talking about it. And um, as a survivor to let people know that, you know, that you're not alone and that there is help out there. We just have to find it. We have to find it. We have to keep reaching out and we have to keep looking for what will bring us peace in our lives and, um, you know, a sense of, of, of self-worth and, and to help us, you know, with our, our survivor issues, right? So there is help out there. We just have to keep reaching out. And that's why I wanted to be one more voice, just to say we can do it. And, um, you know, as I'm a survivor myself. So we'll continue on where we left off. Actually, last week, Friday morning, we were talking, uh, we were actually looking at some information from the Survivor to Thriver workbook. And this you can find on the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse website. Um, it's uh, www.ascasupport.org, and it's a Morris Center program. Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, a Morris Center program. And on their website, they have links and whatnot. So if you have an ASC chapter, ASCA chapter in your city or in where you live, you know, as a survivor of child abuse, you can look them up and see if you know about joining the uh, the groups, right? getting some real help, one-on-one -on -one help and uh, peer support and whatnot, and, um, you know, group support or, or whatever works for you. We don't have an ASCA chapter here in Calgary as far as I know. I did look and didn't see anything, so, um, but you can you can still access their website, and the Survivor to Thriver workbook is an awesome workbook for adult survivors of child abuse, and so that's where we were looking at on Friday and continuing on with emotional abuse and so I wanted to finish that because there's some there's some good journal questions there uh the the, the whole survivor to thriver workbook actually consists of a lot of um uh information regarding the different types of abuse and, and all coming you know from from a survivor's point of view and also uh 
journal questions that we're supposed to answer. And so if you do go ahead and take a look at that Survivor to Thriver workbook, they have, I think the first chapter is called Safety First, and there's 34 pages or something like that. It's a huge chapter called Safety First. And you do want to do that chapter first if you're going to do this Survivor to Thriver workbook because it actually shows you, you know, by, by going through the chapter, whether or not uh, a person is actually emotionally stable enough to do the workbook, you know, because we have to be able to, to to see within ourselves that we are ready to do it, that we're not going to self-injure or hurt somebody else because of it does cause you to think about the past abuse that you suffered, right? This is a, a survivor to thriver workbook. It is specifically meant to help people who have been abused as children to come to terms with what happened to them, first of all, to recognize whether or not it was abuse or not, and then to learn how to move forward with it if it was abuse, right? And so... It is a great workbook, but they do ask that people do not do it on their own, especially if their um, if their journey, if their healing journey has just started. So I went through that whole entire workbook. Uh, actually, part of my shows, I think we we spent maybe three weeks on it here, but that was probably about way back in January or something. You'd have to go back through all my archives, and um, it's a lot of work. So I thought, well, you know, I'm just covering bits and, and pieces of it continually because it's such a great workbook. So that's where we left off, and I think that's where we'll start back up. And we were talking all last week about emotional abuse and what it is, and it's very hard to define. They've come up with some, you know, the the the, the, the people who study these types of things have have come up with a certain set of characteristics that that are known as emotional abuse, you know, because it's it's kind of what causes emotional abuse, right? And um, we, we did take a look at all that last week, and and I'll just name them off again. Because they're, it's, emotional abuse is defined as a, a pattern of psychologically destructive interactions with a child that is characterized by five types of behaviors. And we, we went through those. And one is rejecting. Uh, another one is um, isolation. Um, and then there is terrorizing, ignoring, and corrupting. And we kind of left off at ignoring last week on Friday. So... And then I think we started um, looking at uh, isolating. So we might have actually finished the isolating part. I think that we did. So we're moving on to corrupting. And so if you want to look at this uh, information, you can pull it up too. It's uh, page 45 of the Survivor to Thriver workbook at www.ascasupport.org. And I'm just reading right from the page. And the corrupting is the next one. And this is what is, you know, a form of emotional abuse, right? Corrupting involves encouraging the child to engage in, in antisocial behavior that reinforces deviant social attitudes. And most frequently, the corruption has to do with, suggested, with suggesting inappropriate ways of handling aggression, sexuality, or substance abuse. By encouraging antisocial values and behaviors and discouraging the learning of positive social attitudes and skills, the parents hinder the child's social development. Sometimes a child evolves in a, an identity that puts him or her at odds with the co conventions and standards of society. And some examples of corrupting behavior include reinforcing the child for sexual behavior, uh, condoning drug use, rewarding aggressive behavior, exposing the child to pornography, and involving the child in criminal activities such as prostitution, drug dealing, or insurance fraud. Another example is parents who force their racist or exclusionary attitudes on their children and encourage them at, at, to act on those beliefs in ways that can cause problems for them with peers at school and even with the law. So corrupting is really bad. It, you know, corrupting is like, I mean, it's a crime, really. Emotional abuse is, is, is it's just as bad, or if not worse, you know, of all the different types of abuse because emotional abuse is present in all the different forms of abuse, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, you know, the emotional abuse will be there. Because you know you can't a child who experiences abuse is not just going to be uh, shown a lot of love and support and then being physically beaten or sexually molested. You know they the emotional abuse is always there and present with all the other forms of abuse, right? So that's the problem, and it, it's so incredibly hard for a person to um, learn how to get over that stuff, right? Because it gets right into your very makeup of the of the child, you know, and these behaviors are a lot of them that we develop because of emotional abuse and physical abuse and sexual abuse, right? We, it's 
they're learned behaviors of our way of dealing with these things, right? And so we have to learn how to, first of all, learn what the abuse is, learn how to cope, uh, you know, and learn how to, to deal with the aftermath, right? So it's very, very hard. And if, you know, a lot of people say, oh, emotional abuse, it can't be that big of a deal, you know, it, it's not as bad as, as, you know, physical abuse or, or anything like that. And, and it really is very destructive and um, can cause people a whole lot of problems later on in life, you know, regarding uh, self-worthlessness, self-esteem issues, um, just the whole view of life can be, um, you know, view, life can just be viewed upon as, as, as a, is a bad thing you know what i mean it's like that's it's very very hard on people who have experienced it and so that's why you know if if you have been abused emotionally and and psychologically right you do want to get some help and realize it wasn't your fault and um, you did not deserve it you know and if there was more uh different types of abuse you know you have to realize those were not your fault um children are not at fault it's the abuser's fault they choose to do what they do and you know an abuser has the choice to either not abuse or abuse and so by abusing a child they they make the choice and they abuse this, their children or whoever you know and so they are at fault not us and um it's not how could it be our fault it, it could never be a child's fault it is the uh, the abuser's fault for they're making the choice to actually abuse so we can't take that fault on our own uh, and and own it it's not ours and uh, but what we do have to do is learn how to uh, first of all feel good about ourselves how to love ourselves how to embrace life instead of push the life away, you know, and, and embrace our healing. And then not to be ashamed, you know. I mean, I'm not, you know, like me, for my, for instance, for myself, you know, I didn't come forward publicly until just recently, but I had talked to people about the uh, situations that had gone on in my home and, you know, how I'd grown up and whatnot and, uh, over my lifetime, a few people. And um, some people were very supportive, you know, some people weren't. So <clears throat> it just depended on who who I was talking to, and um, so, you know, this is the thing, it, it's um, it's not something to be ashamed of, and it's not something that you have to be feel, feel bad about, uh, as far as, like, will people view me differently if they knew, or, um, you know, this type of thing, because, uh, you know, if they do, well, that's their own um, issue, you know, and um, they they should not be, they should be supportive, so, you know, that is, you know, I just think that uh, too many times people stay silent. You know, survivors will stay silent, and um, they will um, they will not say anything just due to the fact that they're not sure how people will take uh, the news of hearing that they were abused as children, or or how they're going to treat them after. You know what I mean? And really, we deserve to get help, and we do deserve to have supportive people in our lives, you know. And so I don't allow people in my life that are ne- that are negative. I actually, um, I don't allow people in my life who are not supportive of me. If if uh, someone, if someone knows about my my uh, my past and whatnot, and, and they aren't going to be supportive, I don't need them in my life because I've had enough of that. You know what I mean? And that's where I'm at right now. Uh, you know, I decided about three years ago that I was going to fight to live. And that uh, if anybody didn't like the fact that I was coming forward with my story, then they don't need to be in my life, you know, because um, I need supportive people in my life, you know. Growing up abused as a child, you know, you don't have a lot of support. And um, and then later on in life, if you don't tell too many people, you don't get that support. And if you don't reach out, you know, like I didn't reach out and get any help. So, um, like, you know, talking to a counselor or a therapist, right, where, where, where many will go do that, and that's great. <clears throat> instead of suffering and not suffering on their own, trying to make it on their own, right, which is what I did. So that's the whole issue, right? I, I, um, we do deserve to get help, and I don't personally care what anybody thinks about me um, coming forward and, uh, with my story, um, even the family members that, that know that are not talking to me, and, uh, you know, that, because they know, and they just, they're in denial. They don't want to uh, admit what happened in their own families as well as in our family, because then they would have to realize that it was abuse and i think they don't they're not ready in their own lives to um to recognize the fact that they were abused and that uh, we were abused right so a lot of times people won't come forward because they're in denial and and you know that's fine that's their own problem and they have to deal with that but uh you know if you're on your healing journey and stuff like that you just hang in there and make sure that you do reach out to people get some help uh we just don't deserve to be suffering along all the way through our lives 
you know, uh, that's what I thought. I thought, man, how long does a person have to have to have their, you know, the feeling that their lives are 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 controlled or ruined by the abuse that we suffered as children? And that's where I think the changing point started for me. Got you know about three years ago because I started to look at things a little differently. Instead of looking at things as a victim, I sort of started looking at things as from a survivor's point of view, and also from a third third person's point of view. Someone else in the world who would look at my situation and say, "Does it really have to ruin your whole life? You know, can you not, you know, learn how to move past it and learn to move forward, um, at you know, and you know, and reach out and get some help instead of just suffering on for the rest of your life? Because that's what I watched my mom do, and um, you know, she was very, very miserable and unhappy woman, and, I, and we all wanted her to be happy, like her children loved her, and. Uh, she was so, you know, depressed and so down and and so angry and so completely, um, uh, you know, just her whole life was just so, uh, just so down, you know, so that she could not even experience good times, you know. She, once in a while, when things were going great, we're sitting at somebody's house having coffee, a friend of hers or something. Of course, she'd be happy for those few moments. But inside of her, you know, when she gets home or when she would get home and, and, and sit down and realize how her life had gone, you know, she would become haunted by it all, you know, and, and I knew that, that she was not personally happy with the way that her life had turned out. Well, she told me personally that it was that to my face that that's not what she wanted. and She was not happy with the way her life had turned out. And so I thought, do we have to do that, too? <clears throat> you know, as survivors of child abuse, do we have to continue on on that path of allowing ourselves to not get help, not get help from you know or or, or uh, support from people, and just allow ourselves to suffer on for the rest of our lives. And that that was the big decision, uh, pivotal point for me was to realize, no, I want to fight to live, and I want to fight to have a good life. You know, the life that I know I deserve to have, which is a life of waking up in the morning and thinking, hey, this is great, another chance to have a good day. Um, I'm still here. What can I do to help people? What can I do to help myself? It's not only just about helping people. I mean, I love to help people, but what can I do to help myself as well? And uh, what can I do to make a difference on this planet was really the bigger question. You know, um, just to be uh, someone on the planet instead of just taking up space, you know, and I wanted to be someone who actually can get out there and do something for people and change this mess. And I thought because I, growing up the way that I did, you know, and coming through and seeing all of this abuse and domestic violence, and and child abuse, <clears throat> even with my friends, <clears throat> a lot of my friends were were abused as children, and uh, and uh, growing up, right, my childhood friends, um, and we all knew knew each other. We knew what was happening in our own homes because we would, after the beatings were over or whatever or whatever had happened in the home, emotional abuse or violence, we'd all get together, and some of us would be in better shape than others, depending on what night it was, you know what I mean, or what day it was, you know. So your friends recognize that kind of stuff, right, and. Uh, um, we all knew that we were all suffering. And so, you know, um, it, it was just, uh, I just thought, I, I know how these children feel out here, you know what I mean? I know how these abused kids are, what's happening to them. And, and so many children are abused. You know, many end up on the streets, they run away. Um, you know, if the abuse doesn't stop, they just, uh, a lot of times will take off at an older age, you know, te- young teenagers running running on the streets doing drugs. And, of course, that was our our deal, some of my friends were homeless and some of them weren't. And um, I wasn't homeless, but I I definitely tried to steer clear from home as much as possible. But the thing, especially once I got older, but, you know, we, this, I, I knew so much about the, the the really dark side of life, you know. And I thought, man, you know, um, why am I just sitting on the couch? Like, why am I not saying anything and getting involved when I know exactly what these kids are going through and what, you know, children will go through, um, you know, sort of dealing with abuse, you know what I mean? I need to help stop child abuse, right? So this was something that I, I just had to do. And so it has given me a real sense of, you know, I want to make a difference in this thing and try to help people. But also it's helping me heal because I'm realizing, hey, I did not deserve to be treated like that. Um, it was kind of like a, a it's just it just worked really well all the way around because as I started to, to reach out and get some help, you know, then I was able to help people. And, you know, especially to stop child abuse, you know, advocating and, and uh, I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dream Catchers for Abused Children and a volunteer position, which I'm so happy to be doing, let me tell you, um, you know, to, to get the word out, you know, to people uh, regarding the signs and symptoms of abuse 
and uh, then how to report it and to, to really try to stop child abuse and just keep spreading the awareness and you know promoting awareness and education and prevention of child abuse right so in doing that that was very healing for me to do because i feel like i'm able to um by embracing the fact that i was abused instead of you know just living in this horror of of a, a nightmare you know situation i was able to say okay no i want to heal and then i want to help stop this mess so it does make me feel good to do that. And, I mean, not everybody would want to do that as a survivor. Um, you know, it's not, not necessarily everybody's calling to do that. But the thing is, is you can leave, you can feel good about things. You can move on in your life. You don't have to suffer in silence. There are groups out there you can join anonymously. Don't even have to give your name if you're just not comfortable telling people, you know, who you are. And uh, if you do want to share your story, but you're not comfortable coming forward to let people know exactly your, who you are. Uh, because of uh, you know many reasons, people will do that. To, to serve the the abuser might still be alive, and they might not want to confront them. Uh, they might fear for their lives. That's another issue. And so, you know, it's so important uh, just to make sure you do reach out and get some help. Even with these groups, you can join anonymously, and you can talk to people and get some help. Right? It's so important because we do deserve to have a good life. As far as this corrupting thing goes, you know, um, I have you know my my. Uh, I would say that we did experience some of that. My parents were not corrupting us to be, uh, um, get, you know, uh, on the wrong side of the law or anything like that. But they kind of did in a way because my mom, my mom actually condoned my brother's drug use when they were really young, even though she would say she didn't want them to do drugs. <clears throat> she would never get them any help, and they were drug addicts, you know, big time drug addicts, you know, at, at a young age. And so she she didn't do anything to try to get them any help. So by doing that, she was basically saying, "Oh, it's okay." And she was um, she didn't want the drugs in her home. So when she would find my brother's drugs and stuff, she would get rid of them or, you know, call the drug hotline to find out what the actual pills were or what the stuff was. And but she would never, you know, get her children any help. And she encouraged their behavior, their delinquent behavior because she knew that that was a wedge between her and, and my dad. So she was using her children as a wedge between her and her dad to put us to say that, no, she was going to allow the way that their their behavior, because my dad uh, was having a hard time with their behavior and wanted didn't want to see them behave that way. But my dad is really the reason why they did behave that way, because my dad's my dad did not teach them anything when they were children. And really, any time there was any discipline to be handled, it was all just beatings and uh, cursings, you know, and kickings, right? He did not um, properly bring them up, and my brothers, right? So they did not see a good example, first of all, of how to, how to live a good life as a man because my dad was uh, abusing his wife, not only his children. So it was very damaging for all of us to see all that. And... Um, so my mom used us against my dad. So um, anytime my dad didn't like something, then my mom would say, no, it's okay. You don't have to listen to your father. You can do this. Of course, that would put my brothers and set my brothers up to be in in uh, in uh, friction with my dad, who would then beat on them or kick them around, um, you know, chasing them around the room with a belt and stuff like that. I, I remember all of this, right? So, um, And my mom would conduct my... Then my mom would scream at my dad, you know, you stop abusing my, my our children. Of course, she was abusing us too. See, so there was a whole lot of emotional and psychological uh, garbage going on. Um, they did not bring us up properly. And one of my brothers said one time that he thought that my parents should have done time, and I do too. Um, they were completely abusive and uh, did not get their children any help uh, at all and actually were the cause of all of our problems. So it's incredibly hard. I know that <clears throat> there's 60 million survivors of child sexual abuse in the United States. That's one of the stats out there. And there's there's more than that, you know, probably it's just that haven't been reported. And then uh, we know that there's other survivors of not just child sexual abuse, but physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, you know, the whole thing. Um, there must be just hundreds of millions of survivors out there. So whoever's listening to this show, if you're a survivor of child abuse, my heart is with you, first of all. And because I know what it's like, and you know, a lot of times people don't want to admit it, and they don't want to agree that you know, family members won't support. And you know, if you've grown up in a dysfunctional family, you can't even expect them to support you in this. You know, it's like me; I don't expect my family to, to uh, back me up at all regarding the book that I wrote, which was a life of death, the redemption. 
because my family's dysfunctional. How could I expect their support? They never did support me uh, as a young child, and so why would they be supporting me now as an adult? Even though we have uh, somewhat of a, a relationship with each other, it's still very dysfunctional because nobody wants to admit the truth except for me. I'm the only one talking about it and, and spreading the word and, and uh, trying to... Uh, help people, right? Um, the rest of my family just wants to live in, for whatever reason, they've re- decided to remain silent. And that's fine, but I can't expect any support from those guys because they they agreed with the abuse in the first place and thought that it was fine uh, that, our, that my mom treat me the way that she did. Uh, I was the last of seven children, and so they got to see, after they had already been warped and abused for some, their whole lives, then they saw what my, what my mom was doing to me, and they thought that it was okay. So you mean I'm the last, right? So they saw a lot more abuse than I did. And uh, so I, it's no wonder that their minds are warped. You know what I mean? I can't expect anything else from them. And so I, when I wrote my book and I came out public with my story, I thought, well, I could lose my family in doing this, my, the rest of my siblings, which there's only a few of us left. But I thought, well, I could lose the remaining siblings that I have in my life uh, and also my, my dad. But I thought <clears throat> they were never there for me anyway. And they aren't there for me as an adult. My sister is the only one who's co- who's close to me and actually cares about me. Uh, I think my dad is just coming along for the ride. I don't think he really cares. He says he does, but I don't think he can because he's he's got some problems with emotional. Uh, he's got uh, borderline schizophrenic, right? So he doesn't. He's not really in tune with himself or with his feelings. I have allergies. Sorry about that. Excuse me, but I'm about ready to sneeze. <coughs> so. You know, it's very, very hard on people because they, where do you get the support if your family won't support you? Well, if you've grown in, a, in a, grown up in an abusive home and haven't got any help, of course the abusive family is not going to be that supportive. And that's where, you know, I find that these, you know, it's, it's so important to reach out and get some help with people who know what they're talking about, whether it's a counselor, a therapist, you know, uh, group support get into these child abuse survivor groups online. You don't even have to leave your house. You can just get online and when you're having a hard time, you're having a bad day and just don't seem to be able to cope, you can get online and find some friends to talk to, people who do care and who've been there and know and understand how you know incredibly hard it is to walk through this path of, of this journey. And uh, But I'm telling you it's worth it. I'm sitting here three years later, a little over three years, right almost to the month really, um, later saying, you know, you can do it, I can do it, and I've seen other other survivors do it. I'm not going to name their names on, you can check them out just by looking at their websites. Um, there's lots and lots of survivors out there who are a living example for me and for you, and um, we can do it. That's why I'm doing these shows, and I'll continue to do them as long as, as it seems, you know, as it's helping people, uh, because it's so important, right, to know that we're not alone and that there are people that we can talk to, and that we can get some help. And and I, you know, I I years ago wouldn't have even reached out to a counselor or a therapist just due to the fact that my our parents had warped us, and told us they they totally had warped our minds. And they told us that you know if we told anybody, people would just hurt us, and that if we um, if we told a counselor or a therapist any kind of information, they would just use it against us. And of course, the government was out to get us. My parents were uh, uh, a bit uh, schizo. You know what I mean? Like my mom was manic depressive. My dad is borderline schizophrenic. So there was always this paranoia and uh, fear, and that's how they that's how they brought us up. You know what I mean? In fear and and in, in trauma, right? So it's it's absolutely horrible. So now I know, you know, there's good people out there, and I mean, there's of course there's bad people out there. I know I was born into a family uh, full of uh, bad stuff, right? My whole family, um, you know, born into some bad stuff. But so I know there's bad people out there. So, you know, I'm not naive. The whole issue is, is I know that there's good people out there, too. And when I run across somebody who's a good person, I tell you, you can tell. And I ran into some really awesome counselors and therapists uh, just talking uh, to them, doing the blog talk shows. And they all seem very cool to me. So I'm thinking eventually I, I wouldn't mind talking to a counselor. You know what I mean? So make sure you get some help. We've got about a minute left. And, you know, I just hope you all take care and, and, and reach out and continue to reach out. And don't give up ever, ever, ever. Never give up. Keep going, even if you don't get anywhere too far in your healing every day. You move at the pace that's comfortable for you and, and just never give up, right? It's so important. Get a hold of me if you need anything. Blog Talk Radio, send me a message uh, or Facebook. I'm around. 
Come, uh, tonight, Arnie Alberts on Dreamcatchers Talk Radio, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, interviewing uh, uh, Elizabeth Roberts Brawley and myself. We'll be talking to Arnie Alberts at uh, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Dreamcatchers. And Arnie Alberts is a survivor of uh, childhood sexual abuse. And he's come forward. He's got a book called Burnt Cookies, A Quest for Closure. Make sure you check it out, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tonight. And otherwise, have a great day, everybody, and we'll be talking to you again soon. Um, I'll be back on, of course, tonight with the Dreamcatchers Talk Radio with Elizabeth Roberts Brawley and Arnie Alberts. And then um, tomorrow, actually right after, shortly after that interview, I have my show, Child Abuse Prevention and Human Rights Abuse Prevention is up to us. And then, of course, tomorrow morning, back on with one child abuse survivor to another, 6 a.m. So make sure you take care of yourselves. Thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, have a, a really good day. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.